Good morning. And it's good to see as many back as been away for a week or two. I thought, well, is it me that they're not coming back or what's going on? But, you know, <coughs> singing that one song, Does the Father Truly Love Us? Father loves us so much that that is what I want to try and get across uh, to everybody here this morning, if I can. Um, <clears throat> I have put, I think it's here, yeah. I put a number of sheets of paper on that back chair there that says, Verses for Grace and Mercy of God. And all the verses that I'm going to share with you this morning, uh, most of them pretty well are on this sheet of paper. So if you want to pick them up and take them home and study, and then look at the cross-references for them, uh, you will be richly blessed uh, by the Lord if you do that. So those pages are back there, and uh, I hope you avail yourself of them. You know, um, last week, <clears throat> uh, we had a discussion on the various ways that churches celebrate communion. Some call it the Lord's Supper, some the Eucharist, if you're in uh, Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholic Church or Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. Ukrainian Orthodox, uh, you'd call communion Eucharist. Some call it the breaking of bread service. Some call it the worship service. And uh, so there's various names to it. But we within the Baptist fellowship, let's say, and most non-denominational evangelical churches call communion communion all right just by its name and so in the catholic church the eucharist or the holy communion is celebrated daily in the mass and they believe in transubstantiation some of you may say well, what's that mean transubstantiation well um some of you from Roman Catholic backgrounds realize that uh, the bread and wine are physically changed into the body and blood of Christ instantaneously at time of partaking of the elements, okay? That's transubstantiation. But in most Protestant churches, communion is seen as a memorial of Christ's death. The bread and the wine do not change at all uh, because they are symbols. Communion means the sharing at a, commu at, at a communion servants service. Christians share together to remember the suffering and the death of Christ. So just a little update on that, but I, uh, I really appreciated some of the conversation. And Leo, uh, I appreciate bringing it up on the floor, as you did, because out of it has come this message. Because I was thinking about these things. And, excuse me, and then I got to thinking about the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, but, you know, no matter how we celebrate communion, None of this would be possible without grace and mercy. And that's what I want to share with you and look at this morning. So there's a lot of scripture in what I'm going to say, and that's why I ran these sheets off for you. Those, that you, those of you that do not have a pen or pencil uh, can pick those up. And during the week, take a look at them. And, uh, you know... Uh, Well, I ask you just to take a look at them. Let's just bow our head in the word of prayer this morning. Father, we want to thank you 
thank you for this day. I just pray your Holy Spirit has preeminence in everything that is said this morning, Father, and that you and your Son and your Holy Spirit get all the glory. So be with us this day in thy Son's name. Amen. Um, many get confused at the difference between mercy and grace. Mercy is the act of withholding deserved punishment, while grace is the act of endowing unmerited favor. In his mercy, God does not give us punishment we deserve, which is namely hell. God doesn't give that to us, okay? Well, in his grace, God gives us the gift we do not deserve, namely heaven or the gift of salvation. So, if you, if you have a Bible with you, turn in your Bible to Titus 2, uh, verses 11 and 15. I'm going to try a different pair of glasses here and see if it hel helps me out a little better here. There. Maybe that'll be better. A little bit of trivia for you, though. You know, over the last two years, we've been going through this coronavirus and all that stuff associated with it. And uh, what's interesting, Satan thought he was reaping a bountiful harvest. You know, that little virus, you can't see it unless you have a microscope. He actually shut the world down for a year or more. Shut it down. And was singing, not singing the Hallelujah Chorus, but singing, Great I Am, Great I Am. But you know, a little trivia, far more people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ through the coronavirus period than ever died from the virus. All right? Far more people, thousands and thousands and thousands of people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as a result of what went on. So, on the one side of the coin we say, oh, I just, um, I don't even have the right words for it, but I wish this stuff would have stopped. But just think of how many people come to know Christ because they had to stop and pause and think about what's going on in their lives. And they said, there has to be something better than this. And they listened to somebody on the radio or on the TV. Or they decided to open up their Bible and take a look for themselves. And they came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I shut down my message. I'm finished. <laughs> no, but... We may not think of that, but I'm serious. Thousands and thousands throughout the world came to know Christ through the coronavirus. So I'm not at the point of singing the hallelujah chorus for the coronavirus, but uh, I, I am thankful for the number of people that came to know him as Lord and Savior. So Titus 2 verses 11 through 15 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation, has appeared to all men. He, te he teaches us, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his, his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Don't let anyone despise you. And here's Paul. He's talking to Titus. And as you read through the epistles, you see Paul is talking to this guy, that guy, that lady, whatever, and because all these, I'll call them conspiracy theories, was creeping into the church at that time. 
And where Titus was, these people had come in, Judaizers, and you need more than faith. You have to have works. And one of the things they talked about was when the males would have to be circumcised. They had to follow the law the, of the Jewish law and that sort of thing. And, uh, and so Paul is saying to them, don't listen to them. Don't let them beat you up. Preach the word. Preach what I taught you. And you'll be all right. So I just want to share that. Paul's talking to Titus, and he's laying out some things for Titus to do. All right? So grace is defined as the undeserved love and favor of God toward fallen man. When you take a moment and consider all of that that, that really means, it's really an awesome thought. It means that any sinner can be saved. Any sinner can be saved. Somebody will come up to you, and I know people have come up to me and said, Ken, you don't know what I've done. Don't talk to me about God loving me. You know. Um, and then I say to them, you don't know what I've done. Okay? You guys don't know where I've been in my life. And I'm not going to tell you either. <laughs> no. But it's not funny. Any storm can be weathered. Any situation can be faced. When we sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We're telling the truth. Nothing more clear than that. You know, this passage that we've shared is one of the clearest in the Bible on grace and its results. There's three facts that I want you to take home with you on this. God's grace saves us, number one. God's grace saves us. Verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, so what does grace do for you? Well, Paul, or for you and I, basically, Paul did not leave the Christian with a list of duties to perform. He didn't say, work, 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 and you're going to get there. He said, believe, 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 because God's grace is going to get you there. You know, he called us to a noble purpose, to a higher life. He showed us that it's God's grace, past present, and future. And that's what strengthens and motivates us to live beyond the call of society, embracing obedience to God. And most of the material that I'm using here this morning comes from the Holman New Testament and uh, Dr. Vernon McGee, if any of you know some of his works, uh, I really appreciate getting into what McGee has to say about this, that, and the other thing. But here's something that Dr. McGee says. However, I think the most wonderful thing in the world is that the grace of God is in three time zones. We see that in the next three verses, he says. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared. Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God brings salvation that has appeared to all men. That's past. Okay. Excuse me, I just lost my line here. Teaches us. That's present. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright lives. Okay. In this present age. That's present time zone. And it's a present time zone of grace that God has offered to us. And then it says, looking for that blessed hope. That's the future time zone. These then are the three time zones of grace that has been granted onto us. So if we look at it a little bit more closely, one of the things that grace has given us is salvation. 
For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I can just picture Titus saying this to these people time and time again. Time again. Look, your works aren't going to get you there. It's the grace of God that's, that's saving you right now. Verse 5. Pardon me. Verse 5, Paul makes the statement that we are alive in Christ. And then when, he, when we get to verse 8, he picks up that idea and elaborates on it. And grace carries with it the idea of benevolence or more grace. He has bestowed upon us. And it's on, it, it's on us no matter who that individual is. De it doesn't depend on the merit of you or I or the other guy. Okay? It only depends on the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ towards us. God has not, pardon me, God was not required to offer us salvation. He, he didn't need to do that. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. He'd be justified, he would have been justified in condemning all of us. But just to go on a rabbit trail for a second, think about this. Think of somebody that is a very, very close friend of yours and what they think of you or what you think of them. And then just multiply that over and over and over again. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. You know, in spite of the fact that our actions uh, deserve judgment, God offered us an escape. He didn't have to. Life would have went on, no matter whether he did it or not. But he loved us, and he wanted. He said, let us make man in our image. He wanted to have fellowship with us. He wanted his son to have fellowship with us. So, brothers, sisters, great, that's what grace is. And that is what saved us and delivered us from eternal judgment. I, all too often, I can't speak for you people, but I can speak for myself. I forget about that. Oh, Lord, what's this? Lord, what's that? What's going on? And then I start to thinking. And last week when we, when we had communion, I, I got to thinking about the grace of God and such a wonderful, wonderful thing. He has granted on to me. So let's carry on a little bit. Romans 4, verses 4 and 5 says, Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. There is no such thing as, and I mentioned this a minute ago, there's no such thing as, too great a sinner. The greater the sin, the greater the grace. The greater the sin, the greater the grace. Okay? It says in Romans 5.20 that where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Salvation means that sal excuse me. Salvation means that the Christian has been Cleansed from sin by the blood of Jesus. You know, the hymn writer wrote this. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Some of you guys are volunteers in the fire department. And you can turn that fire hose on your buddy and full power and think you got him clean. You're still dirty compared to the grace of that is bestowed upon you by being washed in the blood of the Lamb. 
and we have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. And that's getting clean. That's getting clean. It says in John 10, 27 and 30, we, I've shared this verse many times. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my, out of my hand. My Father who is given to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So, this segment of John's Gospel that I just quoted, uh, and actually this portion um, overflows with some basic truths. Number one, union of Christ, my sheep, not somebody else's, my sheep, calling, they're listening to my voice, identification, I know them. Sanctification, they follow me. Grace, I give security. Eternal life. Election, given them to me. And omnipotence, powerful, greater than all. So, because of God's grace, we are assured of heaven when we die. John 14, verses 1 to 4 says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Then he finished it off. He says to his disciples, he says, you know the way where I'm going. You know where it is. You know, I was talking a few minutes ago about the virus. I've always been taught, you know, those of us that are pre-millennialists has the rapture on our mind a lot. But I've always been taught the rapture is not going to come about until the last person that God has called comes. And I said, I think it was to my wife and I, probably a few others there last week when I started thinking about this. You know what? He's coming soon. Because a lot of people he called over the last two years have come. Can I get an amen to that? A lot of people have come. And so, the rapture is a, a signless prophecy. We don't know when or any of that, but we know it's coming. And I just thank the Lord. So many people have come to know the, the Lord as their Savior. But I'm thinking, well, maybe it just quickened the rapture just a wee little bit more or faster. Anyways, so... He, he says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. We need to forget about the mansions and glory in heaven that's talked about. Because what it's really talking about is a personal touch of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, count the times that he says, I or me, in these two short verses, and you'll come up with five. Okay? He wanted the disciples to trust him personally, and it was just not, uh, it just wasn't preparation of a place to focus, but it was the personal return of Jesus to take his own to heaven. So what this reminds me of is this. I have a, I have a favorite place in my home uh, that I can just kind of sit back, work on my computer, and... My chair is comfortable enough I can push away from the computer and read a bit or whatever and just think on things and write things. I know that when I get to glory, there is going to be a place there for me that is a whole lot more comfortable than what I got right now. That gives me comfort. All right? There's going to be a place there. 
is going to be a whole lot more comfortable than what I have right now. So, Jesus is making a, a, a major point here. He basically stating that by now you should know the way to where I'm going and why I have to go there. So I have to ask, and I asked you people, do you really know the way? Do you really know the way? If you don't, or, you know, like, like myself, I've been a believer for a lot of years, but sometimes I just don't feel the grace of the Lord. I don't feel the Holy Spirit working in me as I should. And I got to get back, study His Word. I got to get back and say, thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you, Lord, for that. And start getting uh, back in fellowship with Him as I should. And remember, at Calvary, that's when the forgiving took place. Not after you committed a sin today. That sin was forgiven back then. You need to repent of the sin you committed today. But it was forgiven back then. So, what we need to do is confess, believe, and you can be saved. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So God's grace teaches us a few things. It teaches Christian living. It teaches us the negative side of Christian living and what to avoid. Grace instructs us through Christ appearing in His Holy Spirit's tutoring, grace teaches us to say no to those things that are hitting us day in, day out, day in, day out. God wants us to live to the full. God wants us to be happy and not be thinking about things maybe that we shouldn't be thinking about. So what is ungodliness? It's basically anything that doesn't glorify God. So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. 1 John 2.15 teaches us the positive side of living. 1 John 2.15 said this, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So grace will teach you how to live. It was grace that brought you to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace will teach you how to live through that. And it's God's grace that separates us from some of this. Titus 2 verse 13 again. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, God provides the Christian with hope. So in closing, brothers and sisters, it's that blessed hope that causes us to look for Christ. Never forget that Jesus is coming, and I think he's coming a whole lot sooner than what I thought before. It still could be a hundred years, whatever. I don't know, but I just feel how should I? It's written in my notes here somewhere, but I almost feel uh, I'll use two analogies. These guys around the world have been playing dominoes, and they've been putting all these dominoes up. And somebody's going to get stupid and knock one of those dominoes over. Boom, 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 boom. And off it goes in every direction. And look out. I also feel that these world leaders, the, the World Economic Forum is coming up in another month or two, by the way, and uh, I feel like these, these leaders all have a stick of dynamite in their hand, and they have a match in the other hand, and you know that match is lit, 
And Lord help us when they put the match with the stick of dynamite. Pow! And uh, because things are going crazy. But I, I'm going crazy too because I'm crazy in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? I guess that's the easiest way of putting it. And for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first and after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with those words. And that's what I'm trying to do this morning, Lord willing, is encourage you and have you come to a deeper understanding of the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he's granted on to you. You know, a couple things hit me this week. Uh, I have coffee with three or four fellows. Yeah, I got to quit. I have coffee with three or four fellows two or three times a day, believe, or a week. No, a day my wife would leave me. Uh, but I have coffee with these guys. And I noticed all they're talking about is what's going on in the world and these conspiracy theories and yada, yada, yada. I never hear them talking about the grace of the Lord, that the Lord's coming soon, and positive things. But you know, we've all heard of the Abraham Accord, have we not? The Abraham Accord was when five Arab nations signed a treaty with Israel. Unheard of. You have to understand that the Arab world is far more afraid of Iran than the Israels, the Jewish people are, or the other people in the world. The Arab world is terrified of them because mo a good part of the Arab world is Sunni. Hopefully within the next couple of weeks, Saudi Arabia is going to sign a peace treaty with Israel. People say, well, why would they? They hate the Jews. But you know what? Power breeds respect. Israel, after 78 years, is the 10th, <coughs> excuse me, the 10th most powerful nation in the world. And you know, it is number four in military power in the world, Israel is number four. And when they, when they sign an agreement with Israel, you know what they're signing? A pact that if Iran goes after any of those Arab states, who's going to come and protect, protect them? Israel. Hard to believe, but brothers and sisters, it's true. So what's going on is, is, is crazy. There's some real neat things going on in this world. In spite of all the stuff that these conspiracy theorist people try to portray, some real good things going on in the world. In 78 years, you've got a country that was a wasteland. Mark Twain made the statement, what is it, 75 years ago or more, when he visited Israel. It's just a vast wasteland. There's nothing here but dust and rocks. And look at it today. It is just... Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful country. So that's what God is doing with his people. He's offered them grace. He's Because remember, the Jewish people are still his people. He has offered us grace because he loves us so very, very much. So on that note, I'll close in prayer. And if you'd like those verses, they're back there. And uh, then... You guys can sing a final song for, for us. Our gracious Father, we want to thank you for this day. And uh, be with us. Be with each one of us. And Lord, may we come to a greater understanding of the grace that you have towards each one of us. In thy son's name, amen.